Hi, welcome to this special edition of the Market Alert for the PPT trading of the Dow Jones. This uh, comes with a warning, uh, quite a few actually. This is going to be a fairly long video and as for the direction that it takes, who knows, uh, there's so much that I want to actually get through so we could be jumping around a bit. And thirdly, it's uh, not your normal run-of-the-mill type of video either. I'm going to explain to you why what we saw on Friday in the markets is only the tip of the iceberg. So uh, grab a cup of tea, sit back, relax and uh, put your feet up and uh, here goes. So this is the Economist Global Debt Clock and uh, you'll see at the top here it says 45 trillion of uh, debt and uh, that was 2011. Now in 2011 I wrote a book called The Tipping Point about the global debt obviously uh, four years ahead of its time because uh, what you're starting to see in the last uh, few weeks in China this week with uh, the European markets and also the US is the start of the unfolding of this global debt. That's my opinion uh, which is shared by a lot of other people as well on uh, the internet and uh, hopefully as we go through this you will see why. So the current picture uh, 2011, 45 trillion, that is, of global debt. You can see where the debt is. It's the red areas. And if you go to uh, Google, type in uh, Economist Debt Clock, you will pull up this page and you can actually see it in more detail. But just fast forwarding four years to 2015, you can see we've gone up by another 11 trillion in four years, uh, which is absolutely staggering. Uh, and this, of course, is only halfway through from the uh, 2008 to 2015 recovery or, or alleged recovery in the stock markets and the global market. So in the last four years alone, after the government's already printed to bail out the banks in 2008, you're now seeing another increase of four tri uh, sorry, uh, 11 trillion uh, in global debt. So this is uh, what we've got unfolding in the background. And now what I'm going to do now is uh, just show you uh, how bad it is and why it is going to get worse because we've reached this peak of uh, global debt uh, for the time being. And even the Bank for International Settlements, the biggest bank in the world, warned in its report in June that the world is defenseless against the next financial crisis. And that is what we're about to embark upon. This is not just a, a minor correction. For me, this is going to be uh, a changing of, uh, of times and uh, we're going to see some major um, catastrophes taking place as well as far as the financial markets are concerned. We've had that many bubbles pumped up with QE money, borrowed money. It's been a grand experiment by Greenspan, Bernanke and now Yellen, although Yellen uh, has only been in office for a couple of years but we know uh, a track record so far that she can never stick to a word uh, but that aside it's been nothing but a grand experiment by academics that's going to have a major impact on most people's lives so the British, uh, the bank for international settlements has warned that the next financial crisis it doesn't say maybe the next financial crisis it says the next financial crisis and that is just around the corner uh, again, this is my personal opinion, uh, but after the last few weeks, you will see why it's different than it was in 2008. So the BIS are warning this, and the reason they're warning of this is a, a very interesting one, because we all know that the QE money went straight into the bankers' pockets. The bonuses, I mean, this year alone, $118 billion was divvied up between them, and that's across the whole of the financial sector. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, and what's interesting, if you actually go to iBanknet, iBanknet actually um, uh, keeps a record of the amount of derivatives that the major banks are actually holding. For those of you that don't know what derivatives are, they are gambling instruments. Uh, that's how Greenspan views them, uh, which is uh, ironic really, given the fact that uh, when he was in office we had uh, long-term capital go bust, of which he was... Uh, then in charge and bailed out uh, long-term capital which was speculating in the derivatives market and that was just the forerunner to the 2007-2008 uh, catastrophe that we saw. But what you're looking at here is the amount of derivatives that are held by all of the major banks. Uh, these are just US ones uh, and a few other global ones thrown in there as well. 
But Citigroup is currently sitting on, and get this, interest rate derivatives of 42 trillion. And that's without the foreign exchange, the equity derivatives, and the commodities. And this is only up to the 31st of uh, March of this year, which is a shame, really, because we could do with a, a more up-to-date analysis and uh, obviously audit of what they're actually holding. Now, this all total together is a ticking time bomb of 1.25 quadrillion, which uh, is a significant amount of money, as I'm sure you will agree. And unfortunately, there is nothing in place to really legislate against this. In fact, you'll find that most people in Parliament and in the Senate or whatever are absolutely and utterly clueless as far as the financial markets are concerned. This is why they offer all sorts of uh, all sorts of promises in uh, pre-elections that in their manifestos that never come to fruition purely and simply because when they get into office they realize the amount of debt that the government is actually holding on the books and then realize actually we can't pay this talking of which and i'm just going to switch back for a second as i said in the outset of the recording that i would just move around a bit and the reason for that is i just want to just show you something because uh, some of you may not be aware of what's going on in the UK as well as far as uh, the debt situation is concerned, because nobody was transparent about it during the uh, recent elections that we had. But on the Telegraph site, you can see the UK debt there as well. It's sitting at uh, 1,000, uh, sorry, 1 trillion, 1 and a half trillion, just to uh, round figures up there. And the UK debt is increasing at 5,000 pounds per second. That's right, 5,000 per second as... Uh, this clock ticks by. Not a single politician spoke of this uh, during the uh, elections. All they talked about was the deficit and surplus, which is a different thing. Uh, and I'm going to uh, spare you that in uh, this video. Now you can see it's just uh, constantly increasing. And of course, this has increased significantly as well since 2007, 2008, uh, last banking uh, financial crash. So the question is, why is this different to the last one? Well, obviously, the first and foremost is that we've seen a massive increase in um, global debt. The money didn't go into the economy because that's what created the problem in the first place. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to switch to a longer term chart of the Dow uh, to start off with. I just want to show you the bigger picture of what's actually uh, going on. So in 2000, well, if we can go back to the 87 crash. We can see we can see that here. I mean, it's minuscule by comparison now. And then uh, seven years later, we had the Asian contagion in 1994, Clinton era. There was a, a few issues there. And then we got the dot-com bubble in 2000, which you can see, obviously, 9-11 and whatever, and then off to war with Iraq. And what's interesting here is in, uh, I think it was about the 17th of June, 2003, uh, George Bush came out and said, go and spend, 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 spend. Everybody should have a house. Every U.S. citizen should have a house and will make money available through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Uh, and that's what they did. So we saw this uh, huge boom in uh, the stock market as well. The amount of margin that was uh, uh, on stocks was huge, uh, which reminds me, I must show you that before we uh, move on as well. So here we see uh, the correction in 2008, or the crash of 2008, coming back to the green line there, which is the 200 bar average. The banks are bailed out by the Federal Reserve, some $4 trillion in America, here $600 billion. And uh, then we see the money going back into the markets and the next major bubble. So way above the highs of 2008. But what's significant here and what you've got to keep in mind is that the bubble of 2008 was borrowed money. And the market came back to where it was in 2002, 2003, after the bubble burst. And now we can see where trillions have gone into the markets. And we're now starting to see this uh, correction, crash, whatever you want to call it, unfold. And the market's gone up on fresh air to this point as well, on borrowed money by the Federal Reserve and margin debt. And that's what I think I just want to share. I just want to show you and just have a brief word about margin debt. So I'm just going to pause the video and find the, the chart uh, I want to show you. OK, so I found the chart. This is the New York Stock Exchange Investor Credit and uh, the market chart. Now, if you look back to uh, 2000, and in particular this red line, this is borrowed money to buy stocks. And this is not unusual in the US. A lot of people actually borrow money because of the price of uh, individual stocks. You know, you can have a stock that's $700 per share, 
So instead of actually buying the shares, what you do is borrow money and then you just put a percentage down and then you hope that the market goes up. Well, you can see what happens when you get this uh, overextension of uh, borrowing money to support a stock market that uh, when it does actually correct, you can see that people have to liquidate at a loss or whatever to cover those margin calls is uh, what they're actually known. So here you can see 2007, uh, which was less than the tech bubble, the uh, Nasdaq in 2000. And then you could, but you can see that the, uh, the amount uh, that wasn't on margin after was significant because obviously it was the banks that had problems. They didn't get the money, etc until they got the, the money from the Federal Reserve and uh, the UK, or, well, from all of the central banks uh, globally. But what's um, absolutely fascinating is when you look at this now, the current level for this market, given that the market's gone up on borrowed money, QE money, is how much is actually margined, i.e. borrowed money. And that's the problem we've got. And this is what we saw in China. Let me just see if I can find the Chinese market. Uh, and this is what we've actually seen over the last uh, few weeks in uh, China through July and uh, most of August, where we've had prices uh, collapse, 33% drop. That's classed as a crash, not as a correction. The market rallied a bit when they put in all sorts of restrictions on not being able to sell short, etc. And now you're seeing the market return to the downside. Always keep this in mind as well. It doesn't matter what the central banks do doesn't matter how big the government is, they will never, ever be able to stop a bubble from bursting. They never uh, managed to do so yet. They've created them, but they've never been able to stop them. And that's what you're going to witness in the next few months as this gathers uh, its pace. So here we're seeing the Shanghai market. This is uh, why we've uh, got this backdrop. The question you have to ask is why is uh, the Chinese stock market uh, falling? Why is it burst? Well, everybody was under the impression that China were marching forward. They were getting GDP ratios of 20% growth every year and all the rest of it. And all of this hit a brick wall a few years ago. And I said to people, even down at the prosaic level of uh, handing in uh, scrap metal to the dealers, copper and whatever, and I said, do it now because the price is going to drop. And uh, again, the usual thing, oh, don't be daft, India, China, they're buying all of the metals that they can find and uh, will continue to do so. There's a massive boom. But if you just do a quick search around the internet and type in Chinese cities and towns, ghost towns, you will find there are numerous that they built and nobody's actually moved into. For me, that was the clue. Uh, and that was about four or five years ago. That if nobody's moving into these places, where's the money? And of course, China, like every other developing country, has borrowed money now, so they've got debts, etc. The exports fell by 8% last month. There is a major problem occurring globally. And China was seen as sort of the vanguard of, uh, econ of the economy. It would bring the world out of recession and all the rest of it. It's utter, utter nonsense uh, and not the case at all. So China is now seeing the bubble burst. It's having its uh, major correction. And uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Another thing to keep in mind as well, if we just go back to um, the Dow chart, I'm just going to bring in uh, another one as well. If we have a look at crude oil, because this has been telling uh, of late as well, and this is a monthly chart of crude oil. And you can see from uh, the Iraq invasion from 2003, of course, uh, George and Blair, uh, the war criminals going into Iraq. They see the market coming back in 2006, and then we have this major boom with the underlying stock market, the borrowing money, house prices, you name it, it happened. Then the, bank, the banking crisis hit and we see prices come back, guess where? To where they started before George Bush's rhetoric of getting into the markets and borrowing, spending and all that sort of nonsense. So the market comes back to the 200 uh, moving average and then goes back up with the QE funding by the central banks for a while and then hits a brick wall in 2011 and the market's been in a trading range ever since that should start to raise concerns for any world uh, leaders but they don't look at this sort of data that you know all they're concerned about is whether they're going to be re-elected so they'll borrow more money to make the economy look good so they can actually get re-elected and everybody's happy keep the illusion alive and uh, don't ask questions just carry on as you are so here you can see the market trading, holding at the 50 bar average, and then it breaks 
in late 2014 and it's heading right back down to where it was before we saw the market correct in 2008. What is fascinating about this chart and again the mainstream news the economy is doing fine politicians the economies are fine this chart spin, uh, speaks volumes it's actually uh, quite alarming when you actually look at it because here you are seeing the true value of the commodity heading back to $32 per barrel that's where it's going mark my words that's where it's going down to there's no doubts about it in the next few weeks and months because there is a major global slowdown uh, there never was any recovery it was just a QE pumping the markets to give the impression that there was a recovery and when you start looking at commodities you then start to see what the real picture is because commodities show the real supply and demand in a market stock market prices give an illusion that everything's fine commodities prices give you the real um, world of what's actually uh, going on and that's what you're seeing here and again, if you have a look at the commodity index, if I can uh, find it, this is the uh, commodity index. This is uh, at 13 years low. This is the Bloomberg Commodities uh, Index. And you can see prices here sitting down at uh, 13 year lows. Take it from me, but it used to be the CRB index. It's now the uh, Bloomberg have, have taken it, but we are sitting at 13 year lows in commodities prices there. So you can see the backdrop you know the bank for international settlement says the next financial crisis we've got a massive slowdown in china which was uh, leading the the global recovery uh, and i inverted uh, quotes there as well with that one and of course it's all borrowed money it has been for the last 40 years it all started on the 21st of august 1971 when nixon removed the gold standard from the us dollar this allowed every central bank globally to then print bonds. Uh, speaking of which, let's me just let me just show you this as well. Like I said at the outset, I would be switching around, and as I think about these things, I will show you. This is the 30-year Treasury bond. You can see this has been hugging the 50-bar average line for a lot of years, and I'm just going to uh, shrink this to show you all of the available data uh, right back to uh, 1977, and. If you don't know this, interest rates and bonds are inversely related. If I can find a chart of the uh, interest rates, I don't know if there's uh, one available. Let's just have a quick look. This only goes back to 1979. It's the UK and it's the same picture for the US. You can see there, apart from a blip in the 1989-90 era, but other than that, it's been a straight down for interest rates and they are inversely related to the printing of money. And the bond market is the printing of money. Another sleight of hand by the mainstream media when they say that the government's printed 74 billion today, they always show a printing press with the uh, notes being printed, whether they're 50 pound, 20 pound notes, it's irrelevant. They do not do that. It may come a bit of a surprise to a lot of you, but they don't do that. They print bonds, they print debt. And in fact, in 1945, of all of the coins and notes in circulation, 97% of it was uh, coins and notes. Now it's the other way around. It's 97% bonds. And that's why you saw the explosion from the Thatcher Reagan era and this uh, perception that everybody's wealthier, the house price boom and whatever. And again, just to come back to uh, uh, bubbles, we have a bubble in the wine market, in the antiques market, in the classic car market, in the diamond market, in the stock market, which is just uh, being burst. And the biggest is the, the debt market, which we've seen. Uh, there's no doubts about that. And here you can see that we've got the treasury bond market here, the 30-year bonds. They are heading back to all-time highs. This is the biggest bubble of them all. The Chinese have been trying to offload over a trillion dollars worth of uh, US Treasury bonds because they know they're not going to be worth the paper they're written on at some point in the future. So watch this market. Just on a technical note, if I was to draw in from the high to the low, I would say that 162 for these bonds are about the limit uh, before we start to see these heading south as well because as the markets start to unfold uh, more, then don't be surprised to see Yellen and co printing more money to try and uh, stabilize things as the Chinese did 
at the end of July where they pumped uh, a few trillion into the market didn't make any difference because as I said earlier there's not a single government on this planet that is bigger than the financial markets and once the panic sets in then you will see people wanting to leave irrespective of whether the government's going to uh, try and bail it out or not. And talking of bailouts or bail-ins as well, that's something that uh, um, has just come to mind as well. Whether you're aware of this or not, uh, but the UK government, and I'm just going to bring this up for you because a lot of people aren't aware of this either. So let me just uh, pause the video again and just grab this for you. You see, back in 2008, when the banks went pear-shaped, the taxpayer picked up the bill the, gov the government actually printed. But as the Bank for International Set Settlements has stated in its last report in June, that's no longer going to be the case. There is, there's no money from the governments because they're up to their eyeballs in it to actually bail out the banks. So what's uh, happened since uh, 2011, and again, most people are completely oblivious to this, is that the... Uh, the, all of the central banks are not going to bail out. So what they're doing now is bail-ins. And that is, you can see, you have to type UK bail-in here. And you can see bail-in powers implementation by the uh, government. Uh, and it makes for very interesting reading. But in a nutshell, this is basically what happens. We saw it in Cyprus a couple of years ago. And the bank closes and your funds are seized over the value of 75,000. Of which, by the way, uh, just recently, and this you couldn't make this stuff up, really, you couldn't. Recently, the Bank of England, only about a month ago, reduced the bank guarantee from 85,000 to 75,000 because guess what? It's actually pegged against the euro, which uh, beggars belief, frankly. Uh, so it's now 75,000. So any funds over 75,000, if there is uh, a... A problem with the bank then the funds will be seized and under the banking act a lot of people aren't aware of this either that if you have um, when you deposit your money into the bank or your salary is paid into the bank that it's no longer your money it's the bank's money you are technically uh, what's known in law as an unsecured creditor and it's no longer your money and that's an absolute fact and that's why you're seeing all of this here even Carney no more bank bailouts whenever that was that was in 2014 so this is something that's been happening globally. And I read yesterday that from the 1st of January as well, the poor Greek people are now going to be subject to bail-ins as well. The legislation is just going through for that as well. And most of the European countries as well. And Austria has just removed the bank guarantee. Now, I'm not being the prophet of doom here, but something says to me, you know, logic and common sense says, why are the central banks implementing these sorts of powers? Uh, and, and this sort of legislation, if it's not going to be required. That's the question I ask, you know. I mean, it's okay saying, well, everything's uh, fine now. There's nothing problem with the economy. The economy is booming and all the rest of it. And yet, behind the scenes, all of these sorts of pieces of legislation are actually being implemented. So it's something I wasn't going to mention, but it just occurred to me. Um, but again, have a look. Type in bail-in powers implementation of uh, the UK government. And this is now also... Uh, moved over to um, building societies as well. You'll see there that uh, came in in 2013. Um, so even if you think building societies are exempt from bail-ins now, they aren't from uh, uh, the uh, 2013 amendment to the Bail-in uh, Act. So again, something else that you might want to uh, keep in mind there. And uh, what else have we got? I think that's um, about it. Let me just have a look at some of these other charts. There was... Uh, just see if they can jog something. Oh, yes, going back to uh, commodities. This is the copper price charts. This is the 2011 high. You can see now copper heading back. It's sitting on the 200-day average at the moment. So uh, a break of this, of course, is just going to send the market uh, right back down to, guess where, the 2008 uh, levels. But this time, this is all This is all sort of preceding uh, the sort of... Uh, stock market collapses this time but this is where it's slightly different from 2007 2008 because you had the massive drop off during 2008 there as you did with the stock markets but this time they have preceded uh, this from 2011 so the writing's been on the wall from 2011 with the fact that china was going to have a problem because you're seeing this uh, this marked drop off and decline in uh, copper prices and all of the other commodities, of course, which we didn't have in 2008. So the same for crude oil. We saw that as well. 
2011, that's when it all started to come apart. And it's just taken four years for this to start unraveling. Uh, like I say, four years late uh, from the book I actually wrote, but nonetheless, it's starting to take effect now. I think we've reached the point where there's not a lot that uh, the central banks or the governments can actually do about it at this time. So this is sort of the backdrop for what you're seeing happening in the markets at the moment. And going forward, you can expect to see more. Like I say, this crude oil chart speaks volumes. If you've got a booming economy, and uh, like we had in 2007, 2008, where China were borrowing, they were building, they were creating cities, towns, uh, the infrastructure was incredible globally, then crude oil prices rise with that. We're not seeing that. We're seeing the opposite. So the whole thing is uh, a massive deflationary period uh, around the corner. And again, this is why I keep saying in the market alert that uh, Yellen is not going to raise interest rates uh, because she knows the same as everybody else and the same for Carney, what is in the background. Of course, there will come a time when interest rates will be uh, sent higher. And that's purely and simply to try and um, uh, inflate their way out of the debt situation. We're in, we're in you know uncharted uh, territory. Uh, how this unfolds, who knows? But uh, when you're aware of uh, the background of what is actually going on, then it certainly uh, makes for uh, a lot of uh, thoughts, ideas, and also it gives you the opportunity to sort of uh, plan ahead and see how uh, things will actually, uh, as I say, uh, unfold in uh, the next uh, weeks uh, and months ahead. Right, well, that's enough for uh, this uh, sort of bumper edition. I just thought I'd give you a, a backdrop there of what's going on. Hopefully it's um, thought-provoking. It's not supposed to be uh, sensationalist or anything. It's just giving you the facts of what's actually there, what's going on, what's being reported that is, you know, even in some of the newspapers but not in the mainstream. And uh, again, uh, like I say, it's it's there just so that you can are aware more so than uh, anything else. It's not to... Uh, you know, get you to, to phone the, the local Samaritans or anything. It's just to be aware of what is actually in the background. I'm always of the opinion that forewarned is uh, forearmed. And again, just by looking at these charts, you can see exactly where we are heading at the moment. Right, that's it uh, for this uh, edition. I will see you in um, Monday's edition, 24th, when uh, we'll have a look when the markets have opened to see how they are, because again, we can expect some rebounds in this market as well. It isn't just going to be a one-way uh, uh, ticket. It's not going to be straight to the downside. Personally, I don't think there's going to be all sorts of things coming out that's going to send the market back up and a lot of uh, big range days. So we'll discuss about changing one or two of the settings to accommodate for this as well. But that's a, a different uh, subject, different uh, recording. So uh, I will see you uh, in Monday's edition of the uh, Market Alert. Uh, have a great weekend. And as ever, thanks for watching. Speak to you uh, in the next one.